For generations, Ventura has thrived on the dedication and determination of extraordinary individuals, cultures, and families that guided and inspired our community. Family members from these pioneering families celebrate their remarkable histories by sharing captivating stories and personal memories. These are Ventura Legacies. Hi, I'm Suze Montgomery and welcome to CAPS Media Ventura Legacies. We are here today with the Dudleys and related family. And on the outside we have Richard Abbey. Uh, next to Richard we have Sho uh, Sherry Oschlager and we have Bob Dudley next to me right here. So today we're going to talk about the Dudley family and their contributions to the city of Ventura and outside of that. So Bob! I got some questions for you. Sure. Okay, so you were born in Ventura County? I was born in Ventura at the Bard Hospital up on, you just east of where the city hall is. March of 1929, six months before the Depression, and people still blame the Depression on me. I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to blame you today. <laughs> Sherry, and you got to town when and how? We were married actually in Ohio in 1968, my okay. husband and I. And we moved to Ventura in 72. So you've got a 1972. long, long uh -huh. history as well. Yes, uh, over 40 years here in Ventura. Wow. I love Ventura. <laughs> well, let's uh, get some information from Bob, since Bob, you're the patriarch of this crowd. When you were born here, you pro you know, you've seen the town grow up around it, and you were speaking off camera to me about you attended the Little Red Schoolhouse. Yes. That's like, is that considered Santa Paula? It's Santa Paula High School District, but it's an elementary district that's not related to any other elementary district. It's east of Santa Paula. And then you would attended for high school, you went to? Santa Paula High School. I went eight years and one, Little Red Schoolhouse, one room, one teacher, and I went to high school and I started changing teachers and classes every hour. That was quite a culture shock. I bet you, yeah, I bet you were confused. Yeah, that's right. And you met all kinds of new people that you never yeah. knew before because of the insular way you right. were educated. Yeah, most of them were born and raised in the city of Santa Paula and were in the Santa Paula Elementary Districts. There's two other districts, one west of Santa Paula which is still a separate district as Briggs and then north of Santa Paula is Mupu. They're separate, they're all separate individual elementary schools. Small populations, correct? Yes. I, w I would imagine. Well, we had about 30 to 35 when I was going to school there in the Little Red Schoolhouse. Wow. And it's, it's about the same now. The school is still in, still, mm -hmm. uh, it's six grades now with the kindergarten and they have a teacher principal and a couple other teachers. I had just one teacher, Jean Bond was her name. Her husband was the, um, he was the superintendent of, of Santa Paula schools. He made, he had a big salary, he made $400 a month and Jean <laughs> had made $175 a month as the teacher of our school. How'd you find out about the salaries? My mother was on the school board. Yeah. <laughs> the, only okay. way, the only way I graduated from elementary school, my mother was clerk of the school board. The only way I graduated from high school, my dad was president of the high school board. Oh, I, I love it. This was a farming community at the time yes, you grew up. Yes, I grew up on, on the farm that my folks had. My grandfather got the land in uh, 1887 when he came west from Iowa when he was 24 years old. And he was a younger brother of Ben Dudley that built the Dudley Historic House. He couldn't take the fog at Ventura and somebody said go inland to Sespe, which is the part of Fillmore west of the Sespe River. It's not a town, it's an area. And he went there and he started raising bees. One year he raised, had 50,000 pounds of honey. How can but there you was raise a lot of well, there was a lot of sagebrush then, and there was other beekeepers oh. from Santa Paula and Fillmore mm -hmm. too, and they all did quite well. And the Moore family, who were the predecessors of Rancho Sespe, they there was no water wells, and they wanted, they offered to trade my dad, my grandfather, any 50 acres in the valley in return for the land he raised bees in the foothills, because he had rights to. Boulder Creek, which was 
fresh water. In fact, Rancho Sespe, up until probably 20 or 30 years ago, they had an open reservoir. The water went into it from rain, and they this assistant manager told me it was the best water, better than any well water. And then it became illegal to for domestic water to be from an open reservoir. So they still have the reservoir, but uh, anyway, the Moore family, uh, the Mr. Moore was murdered and by somebody, oh and his young son and uncle took over, and they signed the deed that my grandfather got, which was five dollars gold piece. My dad said, "No money changed hands; it just made it legal." <laughs> My dad was an only child, and so on his 40th birthday in 1928, my grandfather deeded the land to him, no gift tax, no inheritance tax. <laughs> but my wife and I, I had a brother and two sisters. In fact, my one brother and sister were twins, born March the 5th, and I was born two years later on the same day. Three out of four of us had March the 5th for a birthday. Makes it easy for birthday parties, doesn't <laughs> it? <laughs> <laughs> well, my other, oldest sister was born in December 23rd, and she really was upset because never celebrated her birthday. It was too close to Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> must have been an interesting way of growing up. <laughs> but my wife and I, we started buying uh, the property from my folks just before my dad passed away because oh, no I had kidding. a brother and two sisters. So it took me several years to pay that off. But so did you buy, then you were buying the, uh, all the yes. properties, by, and you still maintain those? You oh, yes. There was no community property laws, and if my dad had died, my mother would have, she would have had to pay inheritance tax on the whole property. Oh. So my, because she gave a lot of her money to develop orchards and stuff that she had saved and teaching and working at a bank, he, uh, uh, my dad deeded the 20 acres south of the railroad to her, and he kept the 30 acres in his uh, name. So. But we still have the ranch and still farming now. We're lemons and avocados. But now, whereabouts is the ranch located? It's just so I get a perspective. It's between Fillmore and Santa Paula. Okay. It's about two and a half miles west of Fillmore and four miles east of Santa Paula. It so runs. you're close to simi city limits then? Well, a little, yeah, it's still all country. There's no, we're not close that close to the city. I went to the Little Red Schoolhouse, but. Just our east property line separates the Fillmore High School from the Santa Paula. So okay. we all went to Santa Paula High School. You said now you're doing avocados? And lemons, yes. What was it originally planted with? It was in black eyed peas. I have a, found really? a postcard that my dad wrote to his mother. She was in Ventura and my dad and my grandfather were there and they said it was, they leased the land to raise black eyed peas and they said it was the best crop they'd ever had on. That was in 1904. In fact, my, my dad mailed this card to his mother, Mary Bain Dudley, and who was in Ventura, and uh, Penny to mail the postcard, and it went to, mm -hmm. meant to Mary Dudley at uh, Route 2, Ventura, California. And it got to her. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wasn't that like the Lago Marcinos? Didn't they do something with that in the Oxnard Plain with lima beans? They, well, they had raised a lot of lima beans on the coast then. Then they went to Walnuts. Two-thirds of the Ventura College campus was part of the Ben Dudley, which became Oscar Dudley property. So and where they, the Dudley house is, is that the original mm -hmm. property? Well, yes, it was moved north because they put a restaurant, but it was directly south on Telegraph Road. It was where that house originally was. How do you move a house that size? Well, it was through the orchard. We watched it happen. <laughs> what year was that? Uh, 1977. Okay, so that, that's quite an undertaking moving, I mean, especially mm -hmm. with, you know, power lines and everything. No, no power lines were involved because it was all orchard and they moved it through before they built the apartments. Wow. So the, and so you grew up in this house? No, I didn't you grow were, up. You were, oh, pardon me, you yeah. were out in Santa Paula. Right. Okay. No, my, but. Uh, that was the original family homestead, though. For, well, it was for Ben Dudley's. I okay. mean, he had it built. He and my grandfather were brothers, and uh, we used to, his, Ben Dudley's son Oscar and his wife lived there when I was growing up. He'd already, ben had already passed away. 
but uh, we used to go over like once a month or so and visit them. And, but when the college got, was about two thirds of their property was Ben Dudley's and then became Oscar's, they paid 5,000 an acre for that. What would that land be worth now? Oh my God, I couldn't even <laughs> imagine or even yeah. estimate or yeah. guesstimate how much it, I mean, it's valuable. It's right in the center of town. Yeah. It's, well, it wasn't then. It there. wasn't then. No. no, there was nothing there. Well, that's when, didn't town end like down by Five Points now? That was it the was far east end of town, yeah. by Five Points. Oh. Yeah. Was there roads? There were paved roads? No paved roads. They were all, they were paved when I grew up. Yeah. But they the weren't. 126 is a two lane paved road. It ran all the way from. Not a freeway, yeah. Or, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, now. No if you could well. see the traffic on it every morning now, you'd think, how could they ever travel on a two-lane road? Amazing. But, uh, yeah. So now the mm -hmm. Dudley House is historical. It's a, it's a right. historical designation, correct? Right. Mary, Miriam Dudley, who was Oscar's wife, wanted it kept as a historic place. Now it's used for all kinds of community gatherings. Mm -hmm. Well, it, this, these people could explain mm -hmm. all yeah, that sure to you. Yeah, sure, explain to me what that's oh, all. Well, 38 years ago, how did you get involved, first of all? Uh, it was uh, easy to have neighbors that, uh, I guess the Dudley family had uh, wanted it to be a park originally. And when all this development happened, uh, everybody wanted to keep the house where it was on the original property. We went to city council, we did petitions, we did all kinds of different things to try and get the attention of the people. There were a lot of articles in the newspaper. And, and um, what happened was the Dudley family on the final vote had a really smart lawyer who's been a member of our group since the beginning, <laughs> uh, Donald Benton. And he actually came up with a compromise of donating, having Spriggs that was doing the development for the Dudley family. Uh, donate the property on the upper corner and the Dudley family would donate the house and move it to there. I think that's a so, perfect compromise really. Yeah and then they were going to buy the Freeman property next door but when it came on the market Prop 13 had happened and wow. so we got a chance to form our own nonprofit to to do the house. So you're like a 501c3? Right, we are. Okay, so you're self-supporting. Do you remember all of this when this happened? Oh, yes. Were you involved in any of the lobbying no, to the city? No, I was, that was the other family. Okay. No, but Miriam yeah. would like li yeah, write Miriam. little love notes to me yeah. <laughs> oh, sweet. and leave them on my doorstep. That's... She and her daughter Joanna were living there mm -hmm. when the, mm -hmm. they moved and got another house. Miriam's the one who wanted it to become a historic Place, so. Well, thank God she and, had the vision to yeah. be able, and thank God for people like you to step up and to fight for it, to mm. keep it. Now, mm -hmm. when you did, after lima beans, then you, is that when you started with the avocados, or was there a no, crop in between? No, we had, uh, my dad had planted walnuts. Okay. And in fact, I remember mm -hmm. in the 1930s when the Dust Bowl hit Oklahoma and those places, there was a... a young man came west on a freight train. <laughs> he, saw the, he saw the walnut orchard and my dad and others working there. When he got off the train in Santa Paula, he walked back and asked my dad if he could have a job harvesting walnuts. And my dad mm -hmm. let him stay there and, and he was there for over a year. And then he went back. I remember years later, he'd gone back to Oklahoma, got married and he and his wife came by to visit us. <laughs> wow. So That's that neat. dates back. No, he planted first walnuts and then he planted his uh, orange, Valencia oranges in 1929, the year that I was born. The walnuts were planted in 1925 and they weren't irrigated then either. I mean, they're just dry farm, which they go dormant in the winter so they could get by with the rain. But when he planted his first citrus, which is an Valencia orange block, then he put an irrigation system in. So we had, uh, and then planted lemons, and it was, my dad had, actually the walnuts were taken out and planted another citrus orchard about, uh, I guess, 1952 or so, because it was, there was some pests then in walnuts that made it expensive to spray them. Huh. But now walnuts, I mean, you go up in San Joaquin Valley, they're a big item, people mm -hmm. want a lot of walnuts, but 
There was, there was other walnut orchards around then too, and even apricots. I know uh, a lot of apricots in Moore Park, and there was apricots west of Santa mm -hmm. Paula and other places too. So. And these but, are considered good crops, uh, yeah. economy-wise, good cash crops. Yeah, crop. they were, right. But uh, the first, I wanted to plant avocados in 19, uh, I think it was 1955, and we, my folks didn't have any avocados then. And my mother deeded four acres of the 20 acres that was in her name so that I could have it and plant avocado. That was the first oh, sprinkler really? system we put in. <laughs> And my first avocado crop came off in 1958, and I still uh, have that, that old orchard. I've got three other blocks, too, but that old orchard that was planted in 55 is still bearing fruit. So. What kind of an mm -hmm. avocado? Do you remember well, the Well, Hass. I was one of the oh, first Hass. growers to plant Hass. Mm -hmm. People, oh, Hass will never take over. They turn black. Who wants a black avocado? Guess what? 95% of all your avocados right. now are has. <laughs> but I kept, I had uh, two rows of bacons, which uh, avocados need to be cross-pollinated. Correct. And I had two rows of bacons, which I still, in fact, we picked 23 and a half bins, 900 pound bins of all those two rows of bacons this year, too. So they, now you they, sell those? Oh yeah, they, Calavo markets them. They had, they were about 30 cents a pound. Hass now are about 75 cents a pound. Usually they're over a dollar, but with Mexico importing so many until they get out of the market, and now there's avocados coming from Peru and South America, <laughs> place a lot of other places too, but it's still been very profitable. I know we had a freeze one year, and, and uh, my neighbor had all avocados, and I said, my dad told me, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You need to and the year of that freeze, we did very well on our lemons, but we lost our avocados for about three years till they start bearing again. I'm still fascinated by the fact of how you knew avocados would do that well because avocados were not, the, what were they called? Alligator pears? Something like that. And yeah. people really didn't, Hank Brokaw, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you knew mm -hmm. Hank, oh, yeah. that's Elena's dad, mm -hmm. who di uh, Hank died about four years ago. Her, her mom, Ellen, is still alive. Yeah. He came, I believe, from like San Gabriel Valley where they were actually, he was involved in the Haas avocado stock. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the pioneers, like, I guess you were a pioneer in avocados because no one was doing them here. <laughs> no, well, oh yeah, I was, when I first planted that orchard in 55, the nearest avocado orchard was a mile and a half away. Now they're just scattered all over. How would you know that it was gonna be such a great crop though? Well, I was just, interested i just thought see what they in fact i remember when i first planted doug shively who was the manager of citizens bank in santa paula that we did banking with he called me over to his desk and he says bob i got 40 cents a pound for my avocados this year now if you get less than a dollar a pound you think you're not doing too well so they they paid paid well through the years but uh, there is they're the first things to get frozen in the freeze and uh, so that's the hazard too. But um, as I say, it's good to have a variety of things. I mean, lemons have done very well too. They're doing well now too. I went through the Dudley history back to the time when the first Dudley came to the United States, which was Thomas Dudley in 1630 with the Puritans. He was the second governor of Massachusetts, and mm -hmm. I tell people after that the family started going downhill. <laughs> <laughs> I, as I've, I have that history about all the, I think my dad was the ninth generation, my dad was the tenth generation, and my brother and sisters was the eleventh generation. Wait a minute, how'd you get from Massachusetts to locally in California? Who was the first one in the family to make the migration Well, know, we had, uh, uh, actually my grandfather was born in, in New Hampshire. Okay. And uh, he and Ben Dudley of the Dudley House and brothers and uh, their, their dad was a major in the army. In fact, uh, my, my grandpa was born in 51. He was too young to fight in the Civil War, but Ben Dudley and his brothers, the older ones, all fought in the Civil War. And they went uh, west, actually they were living in 
in Iowa when uh, they went west to Iowa when uh, my uh, uh, grandfather was was born and when he was just seven years old his mother died so he went to live with first one sister who was older than her husband and then another on farms in Iowa. In 1875, when he was 24, he decided he wanted to come west and, and see Ben Dudley. Richard, can I ask you about your car that you brought today? Well, that car is a 1930 Model A Ford two-door. And uh, that's the model, they call it a two-door, T-U-D-O-R. I've had it about five years. Actually, I, I've garaged it for about five years. I owned it for about two years. The car came from uh, the state of Washington. It's been in several uh, movies. And we just had it on uh, a new movie, Ben Affleck movie, being shot over in Oxnard a few weeks ago. Uh, that's coming out uh, sometime next year. So it pays for itself, uh, so it, with it, it, since it's, it's a starring role? It's, it's doing OK, <laughs> but it's now for sale, because the man who owns it has some, some physical problems. He's terminal. And uh, so we need to sell it oh, and, and get him the money for it. To, to, but I, I've enjoyed the car, uh, I've driven it for several years. I have another car, it belongs to my father and, my, and myself, which is the same year, but it's a four door instead of a two door. What's and more valuable, two or four? It all depends on how, how you the condition? worked it up, yeah. Okay. Right now, my dad's car is probably worth a lot more than this out here is. Yeah. Boy, that's a beauty out in front. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's a Floor shift or oh, column absolutely. shift? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the average person couldn't steal it if they wanted to. I could leave the keys in, you couldn't steal it. No kidding. <laughs> you couldn't start it. 1930? 1930. So it was a year after you. Yeah, well, that's I was a true. year old yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. You couldn't have driven it a year old, Bob. No. Sherry, tell me what we can do to help you to get uh, more attention to the Dudley House because we want to keep that forever. We have tours the first Sunday of each month from okay. 1 to 4 in the afternoon. And we have actually, after Johanna died, uh, we ended up with most of the original furniture for the house. No kidding. It is fabulous. We were lucky in that Ojai Museum loaned us some pieces, but we were able to return them because it's so much better with the original. It fits better. The Beds aren't as big, <laughs> just right. You know, they were, they were in the place. I believe about 60% of the furniture that we have in the house is original Dudley furniture. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And that, that a lot survives. of artifacts, yeah. too. We're very That's blessed amazing that survives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a gem. It's a yeah. true gem. We have something in that house that many living history museums would die for. What's that? And most people don't even know it's there. When I'm leading a tour through the house, I, I do my best to pointed out. Uh, back at the time it was built in 1892, uh, one of the things that uh, the contractors would do, the builders would do to upgrade it a little bit, is they would do what they call faux grain a fur floor to make it look like oak. Say that again. Faux graining. Okay. And in the kitchen, uh, we have a, a rug over it right now to protect it, but if you lift that up you can see that, that what appears to be an oak, hardwood oak floor, but it's actually a fir floor. And uh, it's being walked on all the time, and we need to do something to preserve it, but it's something, like I say, that other museums would kill for because they just mm -hmm. don't have them. One of the things about that house is very interesting. It's uh, constructed of uh, redwood siding, and all of the siding on the house right now, that I, as I understand it, is still original from 1892. It is original. The redwood shipped down from Northern California and brought right here into Ventura, and it was used by uh, Selwyn Shaw, who was the builder of the house, to build this house. And uh, uh, it has withstood these, these years that uh, it's been standing there, 100 and some odd years. Cool. Selwyn Shaw, who built this house, built several other buildings in What town. else did he do? Uh, he built the Bard Hospital. The Bard Hospital, uh, where oh. he, Bob was born. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And interesting enough, uh, well, the, the, the Mr. Bard, who, who built the hospital, was the first one to die in the hospital. I don't know if you knew that or not. He was uh, a doctor. Quite a, lot, quite a little history there. He yeah, was a Dr. Doctor. Bard. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Cephas. And he also built the original oh. Mound School, which was over uh, near the intersection of Telephone and Main Street, over by where Barnes and Noble now is. Okay. Which was then moved over to near the intersection of uh, where Day and Telegraph is, just just sort of a mile from where the Dudley House is. And now the the Mound School has been moved over onto Phil Road at the end of the, the road over there. So that, that has quite a history as well, built by the same man, Selwyn Shaw. So he was a developer? He was a, a builder, a contractor, uh, and uh, he was built a lot of 
homes and buildings here in Venture. There's a whole block dedicated to him sure. of houses that he's built on, on Poli Street, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, east of the um, city hall. No kidding. Mm -hmm. I did not realize. Yeah. They're like there's old about, Victorians? There's about four, uh -huh. there's about there's four, four or five houses there that he built. And one he lived in. Selwyn Shaw. Selwyn Shaw. Uh -huh. He Very also built nice. the little church down at which, when it was built, it was, it was the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church. And right now it's a bed and breakfast and it's for sale. Yeah, the oh, Victorian the, the, Rose. The Rose? Yep. Uh -huh. No kidding. Mm -hmm. That's what, Calorama, Maine? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. so there are a lot of stories, some of which mm -hmm. I got from this gentleman here. He is a prince of a fellow. Uh -huh. I met him years ago through my father, who also lives in Fillmore, and they're they good friends. And uh, uh, I had the opportunity and the privilege of going sitting down with him in his live room, living room uh, several months back and interviewing him and finding out some of the Dudley history. Extremely. He's just hitting the surface. Well, my mother actually was the one who she wanted Dudley history to be taken care of and also the, the heirs. Mm -hmm. Her maiden name was Clay and her mother was Jenny Ayers, who was Robert Ayers' uh, daughter. He and his family came, I think, from Scotland in the early 1800s, and he got married as a young man and his came west in the gold rush in 1848 and hit it big, made a lot of money, went back. His wife then had their first little child, so he put her on a boat to go down to the Panama no canal, they took a tr rode horseback over the canal oh, and up to San Francisco. And he and his parents came out by wagon and to, uh, they settled first north of San Francisco near Santa Rosa. They came south to uh, Ventura County and uh, he was the first white man in, in Ojai, which was all Indians at that time, Robert Ayers. And he just died about the turn of the century, I think. In fact, he was, he owned 400 acres in the Ojai Valley at one time. Nope. What wow. would that be worth? <laughs> A lot and of then them. he sold that and bought where the Lake Casitas is now, which is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he raised horses there. And uh, not too long before he died, he was living down in Ventura in a house. I think that disappeared when they put the freeway through there. I want to thank all three of you for enriching our lives. And thank you for your wonderful chronicle family history that you have such great detail on and keeping this yeah. because it That's is wonderful. so important to the fabric of the history of this town. And thank you at home for watching us. Uh, join us again. We'll be back with more stories.